What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the All Day ABA podcast. My name is Kayla, and I'm your host. Today, we have a super amazing guest, Mallory from Mindfully Mallory, who currently is a life coach and does all sorts of amazing things as a BCBA and knows all about ACT. And I know nothing about ACT. Um, (laughs) The show notes for this episode can be found at alldayaba.org. There's a little place just for show notes. This is season one, episode eight. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for inviting me, Kayla. I'm so excited to be here. So what is ACT? I, I always say ACT. I know it's ACT, but I always say ACT probably just because, you know, that's what, that's what I took in high school, but what is ACT? Cause I know, I know it's acceptance and commitment therapy, and I know it has to do with relational frame theory, RFT, and that is about the extent of what I know. Okay. All right. Well, that's good. That's a good place to start. <laughs> So knowing what the acronyms stand for is fantastic. You're correct. Acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, It does relate to relational frame theory, which is a behavioral framework. Um, RFT is a little bit more complicated, in my opinion, than ACT. It it basically sums down to truth is relative. And it's it's, it's relative to the experiencer of who's doing the thinking, right? (laughs) So then when we take it into ACT, it's a really exciting thing because a lot of the times um, behavior analysts are specifically and explicitly taught that private events are kind of off the table when we go into behavioral interventions, right? But ACT or ACT, it doesn't really matter if you call it ACT, it's fine. I think it's, it's, it vibes, Um, goes into, it's a language intervention, okay? So we can all agree that behavior analysis plays with verbal behavior, that's allowed, right? Like, B.F. Skinner said so, and he's the granddaddy, so we can all accept that that's true. And what ACT does is it takes the verbal language of private events and allows us to start manipulating that, which we say to ourselves and we are immersed in all the time, like a fish in water, and a a fish doesn't always remember it's even in water, right? We don't even remember that we're always in our thoughts and that we're always kind of immersed in this verbal behavior that's happening. And we start to draw awareness to that in service of values-based decision-making or goals that we have for ourselves to start creating opportunities to be able to make more Um, aligned behavioral choices that are actually observable. So it's like playing with the private events, the language of our private events in service of the life or the behaviors that we want to modify to create the life that we want to live. I have like a really loud and really constant inner monologue. So like, and I know not everyone does. So I kind of wonder, and this is just an off the wall question. And you know, you may not know, there may not be enough research on this yet. Cause I hadn't heard about um, an inner monologue until recently. Um, th- does that like play into AC act for different people? Like, does that impact like how it gets used, I guess? Absolutely. So the inner monologue um, that you're speaking of is pretty present in most people. um, And it's really important, right? Whether we perceive it as words or we perceive it in whatever way that we're doing it, I usually coach people towards um, moving it towards words. Like there's sometimes where it's not right. Where we're really immersed in our experience and like the feelings get so deep and murky and tangled, um, that you don't have a word for it. But what's really cool is that when we start assigning words to it and we start having an inner monologue, like it's a step in the right direction that you have one. By the right. Way. So when we start having those words for it, that's when we get to start manipulating the words and we can start questioning those words in service of our values and service of our goals to be able to start making it functional rather than non-functional, right? right? Or just neutral. So how do you use ACT Act and how has it impacted you and your life? Oh my goodness. So ACT, I say, ACT has saved my life, truly, honestly, from the bottom of my heart. Um, There was a a time in my life where I was so burnt out and I was so overwhelmed. And I was, I had like a full mental health team at that point, right? And I found a really wonderful psychologist who was um, versed in DBT. Okay, so it's a third wave. It's not the same as ACT. 
Um, it's a little bit in its different development, right? I'm in Seattle and I went to UW and that's where it was developed. So we all love Marsha, but it wasn't for me because I had a behavioral background and DBT didn't make sense because of the language that it spoke, right? And so what my wonderful um, psychologist did was take her DBT experience, my behavioral experience, and we found ACT and we started to learn it together. And through being able to understand behaviorally from my framework, the amazing stuff of DBT and make sense of it from a data-driven model that was separate of all of it, I, it truly allowed me to be able to access a strategy that got me out of a really bad place, a really, really bad place. So for me, it saved my life. And then I was able to take it further um, to start changing my life and the way that I interact with work, the way that I interact with how I do ADA, the way that I help people, um, you know, the way that I even help myself, right? So to me, ACT is my way of life at this point. That's amazing. That's super cool. And for those who are listening, who don't know what DBT is, that's dialectical behavior therapy. I know very little about that also, but have like dabbled in that in the past with my therapist. And like, I thought there was some pretty cool stuff with it. So I'm glad that, you know, you and your, uh, was it a psychiatrist or psychologist? Psychologist. Yeah. I'm glad that you I mean, and I had psych- the full team. Right. But yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> I'm glad that you were able to kind of like merge that with ABA and stumbled upon act. That's super duper cool. Super awesome. So what kind of happened like a little bit more to that story was we did all of that wonderful stuff in my private work. Right. But then I was like, this is amazing. This is the best shit I've ever seen in my whole life. And so I started reading books. Right. And probably one of the first ones that I ever read was called get out of your mind into your life by Stephen Hayes, who's one of the founders of act. And it's an active workbook. Like it's not a book that you just read like a textbook. Like it's, you write it in it with a pen and you do activities. Um, and I did that as a book club with my agency. Okay. So me and other BCBAs did this together in service of learning act because I was so excited about it. We did a few other books like that, including, um, act made simple by Russ Harris. Those are the two that I always recommend to people who are getting started in act is get out of your mind and into your life by Hayes and act made simple by Harris, because those were like a powerhouse of understanding and experience and applied. But then I started taking all of these courses with behavior analysts as well. So I did through um, another wonderful resource for people who are just getting started is called Praxis CET, Continuing Education Training Practice. Um, And they have one, they have a ton that I recommend, but the one that I did first was the BCBA bootcamp or ACT bootcamp for BCBAs, something like that. And it, like I was able to meet Stephen Hayes there. I was able to meet um, Evelyn Gould there who became someone I got supervision from later on. Um, I was able to meet so many different people and see so many different things and it just, lit a fire up under my butt that this was something I could do in behavioral, right? Yeah. Um, This is something that I can apply. This is part of my science. So it wasn't that it just saved me. It was also in my wheelhouse if I allowed it to be. And so that was just like, I can't not share this with people because it was so powerful to me. That kind of leads right into the next question. So when did you start working for yourself and how has that been? Sure. So I started working with myself in 2020, the onset of that pandemic, the Rona, she gave us a big visit and she scared the shit out of me. Um, My daughter was born in 2019, right? And so uh, in 2020, when everything started kicking off and she had some health conditions, I just wasn't in my value system able to put her at risk. Um, from where she was by seeing clients, right? And because of the population that we worked with, there were times where we were still expected to see clients, even in a face-to-face capacity, even if they couldn't follow, you know, masking procedures and stuff like that. And I just couldn't, I just couldn't do it. Um, And so I had to leave an agency that I was at for 15 years. Oh, wow. Uh, which was really a tough thing. It was a long time in the making, right? Like that was something that needed to happen anyway, but it was really rough. Um, And I transitioned to writing a book for starters um, 
around the parent support that I had developed within that agency, like the process that I was using there so that I didn't forget it. Right. Um, and then I started moving towards life coaching because that was something that made sense to me. Um, from my experience and from what I wanted to create in the world and using the ACT model, right? What do I want to be? Who do I want to be? How do I want to be? And what values am I gonna do that in? It became the, the answer that had to happen, right? Right. So it was in, it was in 2020, um, I went full-time um, January, 2021, right? So I was all out of everything. I, I had taken like a, what is it called? A telehealth position with an agency that ended up being not for me at all. And we've been running ever since. It's that's, been great, actually. <laughs> that's so super cool. I saw that you already like, did you double or meet your uh, revenue from last, last year already? Sure. So in my first, so when I was working at an agency, I was part-time. Okay. Because I had two little kids, right. So I was working part-time and in my first year of business, I met my part-time salary. Right. Um, and then so far this year I have doubled that. That's so incredible. That is so super incredible. I think it's like, like all, not all businesses, but like a huge percentage of businesses are like at like a loss operating for like the first two or five years, some, something like that. Like, so the fact that you're already super profitable is just amazing. And you know, we can't, we can't really afford to not to be in these days. Cause yeah. Yeah. World's crazy right now. So what is your business and what can it offer to people? Sure. So I actually started in life coaching, but I've kind of evolved into kind of mentorship coaching as well. Um, one thing that I started in was burnout, right? So clinical burnout was something that really impacted me. Hence how I got to the psychologist's office needing so much help, right? Um, and that's a story that is ubiquitous. Like there is so many BCBAs who I speak to who are like, I am in that place too. I am in the like the slipper vacation is on the table type of location, right? Yeah. And that just breaks my heart so, so much because not only is that terrible for an individual, right. And for a family to endure, um, what kind of, what kind of care are we giving to people when we're in that type of space? Like I know from my personal experience, when I was in that mentality and I was just surviving, I really don't feel good about the quality of care I was giving to my clients from there, even though those, all those wonderful people will tell me I did a fantastic job and blah, blah, blah. They had no idea, blah, 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 blah. I don't feel good. As giving care to those people, right. And offering um, services to uh, BCBAs, because I think that sometimes that's how our ABA has become a little bit questionable is that we're pushing ourselves to be people for people in ways that aren't necessarily aligned with where we wanted to be when we got started. And when we start standing up for us getting our own needs met on an individual level, and we start shaping the way that we engage with work, um, that's when we have the opportunity to make ABA amazing again, right? We get to have it be what we learned and what we're excited about and what we want it to become. Um, instead of kind of the, the stuff that's given to us that might not be so dope, right? So I start right. with burnout with everybody. That's where I start. I have, you know, some groups where we do that. I launch those in cohort style. I might be playing with Evergreen in the future. I don't know. Um, I also do one-to-one -one coaching where it's like really getting people towards what they love, right? But then the groups have evolved because a lot of people are like, how do I start a business? I want to do that too. And I've gone through extensive coaching at this point to be able to get a business, um, you know, in the marketing and the selling and the, in the money mindset, that was a huge one being able to think about money. Um, so I have a group on that. And then I also have another group where it's like teaching these coaching strategies, whether you want to be a coach, um, like me, or whether you just want to add act to your repertoire, um, as in ABA, because my niche was preteens and teens who, you know, 
there's the spices, right? Um, and then the parent support and the staff mentorship and stuff like that. So how can I support you in your act is the only reason that I do any of this is how can I get you to catch the bug? How can I meet you where it matters to you so that you can experience what I've experienced, which is magical ABA stuff. <laughs> that is so super cool. I love that. Uh, and for those that are listening, cause I, I know like an itty bitty bit, I haven't gotten like extensive coaching or like I've taken some courses, but I haven't done like a ton of like business coaching yet. And I want to like in the future, cause I want to like explode, but like the two main mindsets that there are about money is like an abundance mindset and a scarcity mindset. And most people in America, at least have a scarcity mindset about money that we have like a, a fixed amount of money that we can earn. And that like, if we earn money, we're taking money away from other people and yeah. just all that sorts of stuff. But ideally if you have a business or want to like expand your business or like add more income to your life, having an abundance mindset about money, that there is an unlimited amount of money out there. Like we can literally print more. Like that's, that's they a whole, did that. yeah. did that. that's, that's a whole other thing, but there is an unlimited amount of money or currency that you can bring into your life in whatever way that you want to make that happen. And that you can offer value to people in exchange for money. You're not taking away from someone. Well, hopefully not. Ideally you're providing a lot of value in their life. So I really, I really love that you've even used that for like money mindset. That's super cool. That's so funny. Cause I actually just finished today wrapping up a money mindset workshop for BCBAs. Um, and it was diving into some of that. And I think that that's a really beautiful example of how to use act, right? Because what we have and what you were saying was we have stories, right? And you were, you were labeling them as scarcity, right? But there's a million stories that can go under scarcity. It could be that someone told you when you were a kid that you couldn't afford that or that like, we don't buy that because that's too expensive, blah, 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 blah. Or like money's evil and people who have money are bad, blah, 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 blah. And at the same time, we get these messages that you need to have money or you're not doing well. You need to have money or you should be like, you're almost ashamed that you don't have what you need. Right. And that comes down to a fundamental burnout situation as well, which is why I was doing that workshop. Um, and why I think the mindset component here is so important because we take those thoughts, that verbal behavior, that's all that is that inner monologue that's happening. And then we become aware of it. And then we start questioning it. It, right? Because just because our brain says it, it offers it doesn't mean it's true. Right. And that is the self is context um, and diffusion, which is part of act like in act, there's six core components that are in a hexagon model where they all touch each other. And you can dance from any single one of them at any single time to any single other one of them, which is why behavior analysts don't like it because it's not super procedural, right? It's, it's kind of messy, but it makes psychological flexibility. And the idea is that you can take that inner monologue and be like, hey, that's not really true. What do I want to be true instead? That brings us back to relational frame. Truth is relative to the experiencer of it and that we can create what we want to experience, right? And so for me, I have you know a value of being of high service to people. And I also have a value that that is worthy of compensation. Um, and there's ways that I provide value to people that are free. Um, there's also ways that I provide value to people that are paid and we agree to those things, right? And it's all about mindset in order to create the outcome that you want to achieve from a values-based perspective, like what matters to you, right? Um, and so, and I think that that's a really beautiful way to illustrate, like we go from this scarcity, like, Ooh, I'm taking from people. Ooh, I really need to give everything about myself to people. Otherwise I'm bad to it's of service to my clients for me to be well cared for. So that way I can be of high service to them in the way that is true for me. And then it shifts the way that you experience work. It shifts the way that your clients experience your work. It shifts the, the creativity. Um, it shifts how What's another word that I was looking for that means fast, uh, concise, how concise we might be, how quickly we might get stuff done, how valuable it is, doesn't have to be time related, right? If we can blow somebody's mind with something amazing, it's as simple as like, huh, that's really interesting that you thought about it that way. I wonder if this way might be a little bit better. And they're like, oh, I never, huh, 
Okay. And it's just a shift, a mindset shift that allows for behavioral shifts as well. I, someone in my Instagram comments recently said something so powerful in like such a very short comment. And I was like, Oh my goodness. I think it was, so I was talking about how, cause I experienced psycho postpartum psychosis recently. And so I've just been in just like a intense period of like trying to recover from that. And I made a post on Instagram, just saying that, like, I'm still trying to find balance. Like I'm still here. Da, 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 da. And one of you know, my followers is amazing and was like, you know, you're not alone. And, um, how did she put it? She said basically that she's not even sure that balance exists. And I was like, you know what? Like, that's a really interesting idea. Like trying to achieve balance. If like, that's not even a, it's not even a thing. Cause every, you know, we're juggling 10 million different things at once. Like, how can you balance everything? You, you can't necessarily. I'm really interested if you wouldn't mind playing with me there. Would you be willing to play with me on that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So when you say you can't achieve balance, how does that make you feel? For me, honestly, it, it takes the pressure off a little bit. Cause like, I, I want everything. Like I want to have, sorry, my cat is like behind my computer being crazy. Um, I want to like balance everything. And I think I get a little too rigid with myself, like in what that looks like. Yes. So that's where I'm going to go next is what does balance mean to you? What are you defining that as when you just loosely, as you're like, Oh, balance, I need balance. What does that mean? Like being a good mom and having like a flourishing business and also being able to like do fun things and like be with fun people and be a good wife and stuff too. Okay. So what I just heard there was a goal, right? Um, but what in between those, right? There's, there's some things that are happening that say like, this isn't balanced what I'm experiencing now. Like this is not that right. 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 And so how does it make you feel to think like you said it takes the pressure off because it means that I don't have to achieve that because it's not, it's no longer a forced thing, but what's happening anyway? A lot of guilt. I have a lot of guilt for like, not feeling like I'm balanced. Sure. So even though we've taken the pressure off of this idea of balance, right. And it's like, Ooh, I shouldn't even have to achieve balance because that's not a real thing. There's still like, I want that a little bit. I want that goal that I have for myself. And that still feels a little bit like now it's not so pressured, but it's also not so lovely to think that I can't have it. Right. Right. And I I've had these same conversations with so many people. And one of the things that I do on my platform is rail against this idea that balance is impossible. <laughs> that's awesome. uh, so that's why I was like, Oh, I'm ready to play with you. Um, because when I think what happens sometimes is that people define balance in a way that is unachievable. Right. And the way that I try to define balance, it's how you, it's a dynamic process that we negotiate on an hourly, minutely, daily, monthly, yearly basis about what we want our life to look like. Right. And it's going to happen no matter what, it's not a scale of two things that are in perfect balance. It's more like one of those giant, um, carnival things where it's got like eight different spider arms and they're moving all over the place and they're spinning and they're doing their things. Right. And it's about where those are in relation to what you want, not what you, um, what you thought you wanted. Right. Right. (laughs) And so there's times where we struggle, where we strive, where we thrive, where we fail. Right. And what we're saying in this narrative of life balance is that there's no negative that can exist in life balance when that's an integral part to life balance is figuring out what you actually want it to look like and renegotiating that. And so when we stop telling ourselves stories, like the mindset, that inner monologue around we're failing because it's not exactly right. That's when we have the opportunity to appreciate it as it is and appreciate the opportunity that it's providing, which is oh, now I know that this isn't exactly right. And now I actually know what I do want. And now I can make little adjustments to get there. It's not from a place of pressure. It's not from a place of expectation. It's from a place of values, a place of excitement, a place of love and wonderful. And anything that's not that is an opportunity for mindset adjustments, right? Like, ooh, 
there's a story there that I'm telling myself. Wouldn't it be really interesting to think about what other stories I can tell? Wouldn't it be really interesting to see that as an opportunity for adjustment rather than a damnation of who I am? And how can I use that to play with today, tomorrow, the next day, as I observe me myself going through my life to create something more in line with where I want to be? So if someone wanted to start getting into act, would a good first place be to like identify their values? Yeah. I mean, sometimes that's the way that I start with people is to identify a values list. That's an exercise that I do with people all the time. There's a, it's called jumpstart to values intention on my YouTube, um, where I walk people through like my five step, like identifying goals and values and stuff. And that's a great place to start. There are some people who have struggle with identifying their values though. So for those people, we might, we might start in a different place, but starting with a values identification without it being married to it would be the place to go. I usually encourage people to grab like Google a list of 200 values and then oh, cool. narrow that one down to 10. That's nice. a hard exercise for people to do, but narrowing it down to 10 is going to make it so that it's not everything that's important. It's these things that are important, right? Because when everything's important, then nothing is, right? Right. So we're going to narrow it down to 10. Uh, my values list is 13 now, so uh, but we're going to play with that. And then we, we redo that quarterly because it changes. Our yeah. life is dynamic, right? That's super cool. That's super cool. So just relating back to ABA too. And like you talked about like seeing BCBAs and other professionals in the field, just being so burnt out all the time, what changes in the field of ABA do you want to see happen? Like if you could have your perfect vision of what the field would become, what would that look like? Yeah. So in my perfect vision of what the field would become, it would be that we as providers would give ourselves permission to increase our scope to work with the people that we want to work with. Uh, because a lot of the times the people work in autism because it is the path that is set in front of them, not because it is the path that they're excited about. Um, and it's the path that feels safe, right? It's been walked, there's funders, um, it's where we got a lot of our experience in, it's where we feel comfortable, but it's not always what we're jazzed about. And I'm all about doing the stuff that you're jazzed about. And so when, even though the funding isn't always there in a way that feels safe, even though the um, amount of supervisors um, or the amount of you know, support seems like it's not robust enough, it's there, it's there, right? Like I wouldn't exist if it wasn't there. And so when you give yourself permission to start doing stuff that you're excited about, that's going to shift the way that you experience work. And that's going to shift the way that we experience ABA, right? It's going to open up um, ABA into a way where it was always meant to be. It was never meant to just be for children or just for children with disabilities or just with autism. It was meant to be for the people, right? It's a science that's beyond autism spectrum disorder just is. And so that's where I would like to see it is where we've got providers who are doing stuff that makes them genuinely excited and not just the safe path that's been walked. Yep. I think, I think that's good, good aspirations, good, good vision for the field. Cause I agree. Well, and I think that's partly where our field has gotten into trouble is, you mm -hmm. know, the, the over-focus on autism. Cause you know, a lot of autistic people are like, can you back off please? <laughs> like, <laughs> And I, I think there are ways to like help autistic people, certainly like, you know, and not all autistic, autistic people would agree. And, you know, that's perfectly valid too, but you know, I, I think there, I think the science of behavior is obviously, you know, about all living things. So that's super yeah. cool. And I think so, when we give ourselves permission to do that, it's when, auto, uh, sorry, um, applied behavior analysis stops becoming ABA which is only associated with ASD, right? And it starts becoming applied behavioral analysis. <laughs> and that's cool. That is super cool. So how can people get onto your email list or like, where can we find out more about everything that you offer? Cause I heard you mention a YouTube channel. I didn't even know about it. I need to definitely go watch it. <laughs> uh, yeah. So my primary platform is Instagram. 
Um, all of my things are mindfully Mallory and they all have the same little picture, except my Twitter. It doesn't quite have the long enough one, but I, I don't really spend time there anyway. Um, so find me on Instagram. That's my primary platform. There's a link in the bio for my, um, my link tree where everything is going to be there. Um, and yeah, that's, I mean, there's, you can get on my email list there. I'm not as much of an email sender, but I am always on my Instagram. That's so awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I, I will definitely link your Instagram and your YouTube channel in the, uh, in the show notes. And yeah, I appreciate you coming on and teaching us about act. Thank you oh so, so God. much. Yes. Thank you so much. It was an honor to be able to share this information. Like I said, this is something that genuinely gets me excited and that I believe is like like it's a dream come true that this is my job now and that I get to talk with you and other people who are interested in these things. Like I can't, sometimes it's like, pinch me. I can't believe it. So thank you for inviting me because this is absolutely an honor. Of course. Um, the show notes, just a, ri a reminder for everybody, the show notes can be found at alldayaba.org. And this is season one, episode eight with Mindfully Mallory. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the listeners. Have a good one. Bye.